That one's yours. That one. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> knock, knock. Interrupting sheep. Interrupting. Bah! <laughs> How about this one? Knock, knock. Interrupting sloth. Interrupting sloth. Sloth. <laughs> I've only got one more, you'll be pleased to know. Knock, knock. Interrupting Mike Rutter. Interrupting. Back when I was in Israel. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Sorry, Mike. That was a bit mean, but I, I couldn't resist it. Uh, we're going to think today about interruptions, hence the uh, interrupting theme of the knock-knock jokes. Uh, we're going to think about Advent, how it's a time of waiting, but a time of waiting that gets suddenly interrupted by the presence of Jesus. Um, we're going to think about Jesus' first coming at Christmas. We're going to remember how the Old Testament people, the Jewish people, God's people, were waiting for a Messiah and a Savior, and suddenly their waiting gets interrupted by the presence of Jesus as a baby at Christmas. And then we're also going to think about Jesus' second coming. That's what we do at Advent. We think both about Jesus coming at Christmas and also about him coming again um, when he returns. We're going to think about what it's like for us to be waiting in this place, waiting and hoping and expecting Jesus to return one day and looking forward to that moment of interruption where God breaks into our reality and I found a good quote by someone called Judith Bauer, who put this slightly more uh, eloquently than me. She's talking about the different weeks of Advent and how Christmas Day um, just kind of bursts in on us, on us. She says, because Christmas falls on a different day of the week each year, it's like the fourth week of Advent is never really finished. It is abruptly, joyously, and solemnly abrogated by the annual coming again of Christ at Christmas. And Christ's second coming will one day abruptly interrupt our sojourn here on earth. So we're going to have a little look at Jesus' first coming and at his second coming, at what it's like to wait and what it's like for Jesus to interrupt and break in to the middle of our waiting. So first we're going to think a little bit about those people in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, the Israelites, who were waiting and hoping for a Messiah, for a Savior. And if you know a little bit about the Old Testament, you'll know that it's full of God's promises to bring restoration, transformation, to heal his people, to restore his people, to save them. Um, and the Jewish people often found themselves uh, under the rule of foreign nations. They would often find themselves in places they didn't want to be, or even when they were in their, their home in the promised land, they'd find themselves under the rule of foreign empires. You could think of the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, and around Jesus' time, the Romans. And so the Jewish people often expected the fulfillment of God's Old Testament prophecies to be met with some kind of warrior king. And you see that a bit in the New Testament. When people see Jesus, they're expecting him to overthrow the Roman Empire or the, the powers that be at the time. And it must have felt for them like however long they waited, there was always some new thing, some new power that was coming to oppress God's people and bring about suffering and pain. And what they desperately wanted, their great hope, was just to live in the land that God had given them, to live peacefully, to have the temple in Jerusalem to worship at. And that was their, their great hope, their great weight, their great longing. You might think of, um, the, the, do you remember the guy Simeon in Luke chapter 2? It says he's waiting in the temple. He's an old guy, and Jesus is brought in um, to be presented in the temple. And Simeon, it says he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's been waiting for many years. He's kind of a representative of the Jewish people as a whole, waiting and waiting for God to burst in and interrupt the waiting. And he meets the baby Jesus, and he's filled with joy and speaks about how significant Jesus is going to be. 
So we've got our people who are waiting and longing for a savior. And suddenly, there's an interruption to that waiting. And it's inter an interruption that comes through the birth of a baby, of a child. If you know any children, you may know that they're quite good at interrupting things. Um, they're not often quiet. They rarely go unnoticed. Childbirth itself, if you've ever been around for that, that's quite disruptive as well. And babies themselves can be quite loud. And that's what happens at Christmas. Mary and Joseph's lives are interrupted by the sudden pre presence of this baby. They get these visits from angels, uh, sometimes in their dreams, sometimes in the middle of the day. Um, God's just interrupting and breaking into their reality and to their story. And Jesus' birth is accompanied by other dramatic things, dramatic interruptions. We've got angels singing in the sky. We've got shepherds coming in to visit baby Jesus. We've got this star in the sky. We've got visitors coming from the east. All kinds of interruptions to what otherwise would have been the ordinary life of a married couple in first century Palestine. And one particular thing I want us to think a little bit about this morning is where Jesus was born. We often assume and think that Jesus was born in a stable. Um, and I want to suggest to you that this is a slightly misguided assumption. It's one that uh, comes from uh, an old and slightly inaccurate translation of a Greek word. Um, you can have a look here at this diagram of a Palestinian house in, first century, um, in the first century when Jesus was around. You've got the main family living room. You've got the animals who would have been kind of in a separate part of the house, but right next to the main house, if that makes sense. So you might call it a stable, but it's still kind of part of the house. And you would have had the mangers right there as well. And then there's this word, catalima, which would have been the guest rooms. They would have had a room for guests to be hospitable when family came to visit, which is exactly what was happening in Bethlehem. All these family members were coming in to visit. And it says there's no room in the catalima, in the guest room. And so Mary and Joseph, rather than being out in a stable, they're right in the middle of the main family room. Um, and you might think, well, does this really matter? Does it matter where Jesus was born? Does it matter? Should we be getting angry at people who say he was born in a stable? And I think we shouldn't. Um, but I do want to say that there's just one slightly significant thing of this detail that I think is helpful for us. Um, and there's a theologian called Ian Paul who puts this particularly well. He says, Jesus and his birth are a powerfully disruptive force, bursting in on the middle of ordinary life and offering the possibility of its transformation. In the Christmas story, Jesus isn't sad or lonely, some distance away in the stable, needing our sympathy. Rather, he's right in the midst of the family and all the visiting relations, right in the thick of it and demanding our attention. It's still undoubtedly significant that Jesus' birth doesn't happen in a human palace. You might remember the wise men going to Herod's palace thinking that's where the king's going to be born. He's still born in somewhere that's humble, even if it's not a stable. But what's significant about him being born in the middle of the family is that Jesus is bursting into our reality in an unexpected way. And he's almost demanding to be noticed. He might be somewhere that's unimportant in human terms, but he's still right at the thick of the family, right in the center of everything. And he offers the people there a choice. Are you willing to have your reality disrupted and interrupted by the living God? That was the choice that Mary had when Gabriel came to her and said, you're going to have a son. You're going to give birth to the living God. I don't know if God would have got ahead with it anyway, but Mary answers affirmatively and says, may it be of you, as you have said. I'm willing to have my reality interrupted by God. And that's maybe a little challenge for us at Christmas this year. Are you willing to have your reality interrupted and disrupted by God? Your plans, your ideas, your dreams, your hopes. Are you willing to let God come in and be in the middle of those? And I thought I would interrupt this sermon with a classic example of a child interrupting something which an adult thought was important. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? <laughs> 
Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year. <laughs> it's so good. Every time you watch it, there's like a new thing you notice when she like comes in at the end and tries to slam the door. Or like the first time she comes in, she kind of slides to a stop in her desperation to stop the children <laughs> interrupting the interview. I really like the bit at the start when he kind of, he, he's looking at his like self view in the screen and he's kind of reaching for the child's face and sort of shoves the child in the face. It's so good. Children are really good at interrupting things, bursting in on the things that we think are important, the plans, the purposes that we have, the ideas that we have. And Jesus bursts in to our reality a bit like that. Let's have a think about Jesus' second coming. And this is kind of where you and I sit now as the church. We are waiting for Jesus to return. We're waiting for Jesus to wipe away every tear from our eyes. We're waiting for the dead to be raised. We're waiting for heaven and earth to be reunited. We're waiting for God to be present permanently and perfectly with his people again. That's what we wait for. That's what we're longing for. And we're called to, to get on with being faithful to God in the midst of that. We're called to look for signs of God's kingdom coming here and now, but we're still waiting for it to come in its fullness. And one day, just like Mary and Joseph's waiting and hoping was interrupted by the baby Jesus, one day our reality will be interrupted by the risen, reigning, ascended Lord Jesus coming back to earth. And the most popular way that the New Testament talks about Jesus' interruption is to talk about it being like a thief in the night. This is a metaphor Jesus uses quite a lot in the Gospels. It's one that's picked up later in the New Testament by Peter and Paul too. Uh, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It's quite a sudden unexpected image and quite a scary one. I remember when I was a kid, um, I don't think we actually woke up, but we definitely came down in the morning and my parents were pretty sure someone had been into like burgle stuff from our house. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced that, but it's a pretty terrifying thing. And it's a pretty scary image that Jesus uses. And I want to just unpack a little bit of why this is the image that Jesus goes for. You may know that each of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, have a passage where Jesus speaks at some length about his second coming. It's quite confusing to read at first because he seems to talk about all kinds of different things that might happen in the future at different times. Um, it's in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. They all use a lot of the same material. They include different things that Jesus said. It's sometimes called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus was speaking on <clears throat> the Mount of Olives. I'm sure if Mike was doing this talk, he'd show you a lovely picture of the Mount of Olives. <laughs> I'm just going to read to you. I've not been to the, the Mount of Olives. I'm sure it's great. Um, I'm just going to read to you. I'm so sorry, Mike. I'm just going to read to you a short bit from Matthew chapter 24. Um, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. <laughs> 
again, this is quite a scary image. What's Jesus saying? Why is he using this terrifying example of judgment in the flood? Um, what's he talking about? What does he want us to get from this? He seems to be saying this to his disciples. It gets written down and put in the Gospels for us to read and reflect on today. Um, why is this important and helpful for us? Well, one note that I want to say on this particular passage before we go any further is that I don't believe that the bit about one person being taken away is talking about what's commonly called the rapture, um, where Christians get zoomed off up to heaven and everyone else gets left down here. Um, I think the image, if you look at it carefully, he's drawing a comparison with Noah and the flood where it was not the righteous people who trusted God who were taken away, but it's those who rejected God who were taken away in the flood. I don't think we need to stretch these images too literally or too far, um, but I think it's worth saying that um, this is not the, the, what's commonly called the rapture. I don't think that's particularly a biblical and helpful image. So what do we do about these complicated, difficult questions of God's judgment and God's wrath, God's judgment when he comes again at his second coming? We might like to believe that Noah's flood didn't really happen. Plenty of Christians do that. We might like to believe that all the passages in the Bible that talk about God's judgment or wrath aren't really there. It's much easier to ignore them. We've probably all heard of preachers whose primary message is something along the lines of turn or burn. And perhaps sometimes we're so keen to distance ourselves from that way of preaching and thinking that we totally ignore any mention of God's judgment. So, I wanted to say something about it this morning. I certainly don't have time to answer all the questions that we might have. Some theologians have suggested that these passages where there's really shocking imagery about God bringing judgment upon people who reject him. Some people say that those shocking images are there to shock us out of apathy, to shock us into a response towards God. Um, that maybe they're using over-the-top language about God's judgment um, to encourage us to turn back to him. And that, that might be true. Um, it might mean that some of those images are not to be taken literally, and they're just supposed to jolt us out of our, our spiritual apathy and say, wow, actually, yeah, this is a really shocking image. I'm going to turn back and live my life for God now. And that might be true. Um, that might be um, quite, it might not be true. I, I don't want to necessarily answer that question, but just throw that possibility out there. The other day, I was driving um, in Sheffield, and I saw this beautiful rainbow as I was driving. I had to pull over in my car and take a photo of it. The photo obviously doesn't do it justice, but it was, it was very, very, very bright. I could see all the different colors. I can't see them as well in the photo, but um, you could really see every single color of this rainbow. And it reminded me, um, perhaps obviously, um, of the rainbow at the end of the flood story in Genesis chapters 8 and 9. Um, you might remember what God says to Noah after the flood. God says, I have hung my bow in the clouds. And what's interesting is that the Hebrew word that gets usually translated as rainbow um, just simply means bow. So it can refer to a rainbow in the clouds, as it obviously does in that context. But it can also refer to a bow like a bow and arrow that you'd use in a battle. Um, and whatever you think um, the passages about God's wrath and judgment might mean, there's one thing we can be really sure about, um, and that's that God makes a way for his wrath and judgment to fall on himself in the person of Jesus at the cross. And that's why when we come to Christmas, we look at the Christmas story through the light of the cross. Um, me and my family have this really good Bible um, called the Jesus Storybook Bible, you may not be able to read the words on this, but um, it's just a little photo of what it looks like. This is the end to the story of Noah's Ark, and it puts this idea particularly beautifully. I'm just going to read a few words from it. This is God um, at the end of the flood speaking to Noah. Like a warrior who puts away his bow and arrow at the end of a great battle, God said, see, I have hung up my bow in the clouds. God's strong anger against the hate and sadness and death would come down once more 
but not on his people. No, God's war bow was not pointing down at his people. It was pointing up into the heart of heaven. In Jesus, God makes a way for his judgment to fall on himself rather than on his people. Jesus' second coming will be a shock for many people. It will be a surprise. It will come like a thief in the night. But for anyone who's put their trust in Jesus, it's not a day that we have to fear or worry about. It's actually a day we're to welcome and long for. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I don't want you to believe in Jesus out of a sense of fear. But I also don't want to ignore the concept of Jesus bringing judgment on those who reject him. I don't want to say that that's not there in the Bible. But I do want to tell you that Jesus has made a way that you don't have to experience any sense of judgment or separation from God because Jesus chooses to take God's punishment on himself at the cross. And the call for us is to be ready for Jesus to come back. That's the kind of end of this thief in the night metaphor. It's if you're ready for someone to come into your house in the middle of the night, it's not so much of a surprise and the consequences might not be quite so bad. So what does it mean to be ready? Sometimes we get the language of being awake rather than being asleep in the night. And there's a verse in Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse um, which offers an answer. This is Jesus speaking. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day, the day when Jesus returns, will close on you suddenly like a trap. Gives us quite a clear picture of what it looks like not to be ready for Jesus when we are weighed down with the joys and pleasures of this life, the worries of this life and not focusing and centering ourselves on the things of God. I was chatting recently um, to to Liz, my wife. You may know that she's been working a few hours a week doing some communications for the church, um, doing posts on social media, sorting out the website a bit, um, sending people messages on the WhatsApp group. And it's such a simple thing in one sense to send messages saying, church is happening this Sunday. Um, this is what's going on, why don't you come along? Um, And it got me thinking, why does it seem so significant? Why is it so helpful for us to communicate well as a church? And I think one of the reasons is that our natural tendency as humans, if we don't allow God to work in our lives and if we don't have people around us reminding us, our natural tendency is just to slowly drift away from God. That's why you find it really hard, most of us often find it hard, to set aside times to pray, times to read the Bible. Um, our flesh, our, our, this part of our self that can sometimes ignore God, we, we don't want him. There's an enemy that prowls around looking for ways to disrupt us from praying and reading our Bibles and coming to church. Uh, and so these reminders are like, yeah, actually, come to church. This is going to be good. And there's a sense in which I'm obviously preaching to the converted because you have all chosen to interrupt your Sunday morning to come to church, to sing songs to Jesus and hear about the Bible and pray and come together with other Christians. You could be at home, you could be shopping, you could be watching a nice Christmas movie. Um, But Christmas maybe is like a key time where we can get weighed down with partying and the anxieties of life. We've talked about that this morning, how it can be a time of worry and stress. And Jesus says, don't get weighed down by these things. Let me interrupt your reality. Let me interrupt your preparations for Christmas. Let me burst in to the middle of your waiting and transform your life. And so that's where I want to finish this morning, really, coming back to that question. Are you willing to let Jesus interrupt your life? Are you willing for Jesus to interrupt your Christmas? Generally, we hate the idea of being interrupted. It's quite inconvenient. Things get in the way of what we want to do. We have to surrender our control of a situation, our control of how we spend our time. 
But I believe that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to surrender to, to his ways, to his plans, to his purposes, not just to pursue our own. And I want to suggest, as another way of answering that question, are you ready for Jesus to come back if he chose to come back today or tomorrow or maybe on Christmas Day even? I want to suggest that if you're willing for Jesus to interrupt your life now, you're probably ready for him to come back. And so that's a good question to, to think of and to ask a few questions about during this Christmas season. I wonder if Mike and Brett would just come back up and we're going to sing together in a minute. But perhaps you'd just like to take a moment in silence just to reflect and say, what does it look like for me to surrender control of my time and my energy and to let Jesus interrupt my life this Christmas? Have I got space in my time, in my schedule? Have I got room in my heart? That's been the theme of our Advent services, hasn't it? Is there room in your heart for Jesus to interrupt, to break in, to burst in and bring transformation? Let's just have a moment of silence just to reflect and ask Jesus how he might like to interrupt our lives. Lord Jesus, thank you for the way that you burst into this world as a baby. Thank you that your birth was a cause of great celebration. And thank you for the opportunities we have this Christmas time to remember and celebrate your coming to earth as a baby. Jesus, help us to long for your coming again. Help us to look forward to the day when you come, when you wipe away every tear from every eye, when you bring us into the fullness of relationship and presence with you in a way that we've never known. May we see signs of that here and now. May these moments that we're gathered together this morning be a little taste and glimpse of heaven on earth. And Lord, help us in the coming days and weeks to make space for you in our hearts and lives. Lord, forgive us when we're too busy. Forgive us when our hearts and our time and our energy are set on other things that may be good and may be important, but maybe aren't as good or important as you. Lord, we need your help. We are weak. Sometimes we find it hard to choose you. We find it hard to let go of the control of our time and energy. But we say to you again today that we surrender to you, Jesus. We are yours. We submit to you, to your plans and purposes for our lives, for our time. And we pray that these coming days and weeks would be a time where you are at the center and the head of all that we are and do. Amen.